Hello and welcome, space lovers. Thank you. As is always the case in COVID, we had a little bit of technical issue to start, but we're here now and so excited to be with you. Uh, welcome to our Unistellar and SETI Live in celebration of Citizen Astronomy Month, where we're inviting our socially distant space lovers from around the globe to connect virtually under the cosmos. And so I want to jump right into today's topic of planetary defense. What is it? Why does it matter? And how are citizen astronomers involved in all of this? So as with today, I am joined, um, as with last week, excuse me, I'm joined today by Frank Marchis, who you see our beautiful, handsome icon in the lower right. <laughs> I'm Hi. also joined by one of the world's leading experts on today's topic, a true legend, a real life astronaut, Dr. Ed Liu. Ed's an explorer. His quest is to map the unknown and most recently to unveil the secrets of the inner solar system. Ed co-founded the B-12, which we're going to talk about momentarily with a few other Apollo 9 astronauts and other esteemed professionals. And Ed currently serves as executive director of the Asteroid Institute. And you heard me right. We're talking to a real life NASA astronaut. I wore my sweatshirt for the occasion. He's flown three missions, logged 206 days in space to construct and live aboard the International Space Station. He even received NASA's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal. So welcome, Ed. And I'm going to start with a two-part question for you. Can you tell me more about the B612 and why it was founded in the work that you do? And also, I'm curious, you've been involved in so many different aspects of space and discovery. So why has the topic of asteroids become a focus for you? Okay, a lot of questions to unwrap there. Uh, first off, B612 Foundation, it's a foundation that me and a couple of other um, astronauts and, and uh, scientists started to work on the problem of planetary defense. And planetary defense means keeping asteroids from hitting the Earth, and, and, and large asteroids from hitting the Earth. Small ones, those are fine. Uh, those are just shooting stars. Now, we started this organization actually something like 18 years ago. Oh, wow. Um, and the field has grown quite a bit. Um, back in the day, um, it wasn't this problem wasn't really taken seriously by governments. Uh, it was there was some tiny amount of funding at NASA, but it really wasn't a major part of NASA at all. Uh, it didn't have a whole heck of a lot of support. Uh, fast forward to today, and it is a major part of NASA's programs. It is a major part of the European Space Agency programs. Uh, there are ongoing missions to asteroids. There is even a, uh, a deflection test uh, of, an, of a real live asteroid going that will launch next year. Hey, Frank, your ca camera works. Awesome. A shovel <laughs> shot while you're talking. <laughs> One way to go from launching a mission to deflect an asteroid is getting your audio visual to work. And uh, so, you know, we started this back when there weren't a lot of people working on this. And um, I think we've, you know, we've grown along with the field and uh, the field has matured a lot. The ideas for and our understanding of how to deflect asteroids has really come a long ways. But most importantly, we, you know, the we are all working towards finding and tracking asteroids, which is, as it turns out, the majority of the, the battle. It is far more difficult to find and track all the asteroids than it is to deflect an asteroid that you know to be hitting uh, on its way to hit the Earth, as long as you have uh, enough warning time. So that's the problem we've been working on. And you can think of that, what we've been saying, is if you find and track all the asteroids and know where they're going to be in the future, essentially what you have done is created the first map, real map of the solar system. Uh, although... It, you know, it's fair to say right now that the map is very much incomplete of the solar system because the vast majority of, of large asteroids in our solar system are not yet tracked. And so I'm curious, you have achieved something that, you know, kids dream about their entire lives. You've been to space, you've worked on the space station. Of all the adventures you could have in life, why have asteroids captivated your attention at this point in your career? Well, I've been interested in asteroids since since I was a graduate student, even long before I ever had even thoughts of becoming an astronaut, um, because when I was a kid growing up, I loved two things. I loved space and I loved dinosaurs. And I always wondered, along with everybody else, why are there no dinosaurs today? 
you know, why can't I go see one in the zoo? Um, you know, what happened to them? I even had a book. It was called The How and Why Wonder Book of Dinosaurs. And the last chapter, the last little bit of the last chapter said, and then all the dinosaurs died and we have no idea why. <laughs> and, that was it. and I remember in graduate school when this theory came out that, you know, maybe a large asteroid did in the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. uh, theory that came, you know, it was due to uh, um, a physicist named Louis Alvarez and his son, Walter. And it seemed preposterous. So like, well, how could that be, you know? Um, and then when we, uh, me and some of the other graduate students, I remember looking at our, you know, on our board, on our whiteboard in our office, working out some of the numbers and we're like, wow, that really is an awful lot of energy. Yeah, that really could do an enormous number to, you know, our, the ecosystem of the earth. And, and it sort of became clear. And then I remember the day when they announced the discovery of the crater, uh, which is underneath the, the Gulf of Mexico that sort of sealed it up. That's the smoking gun. That was the crater that matches the date in which there are dinosaur fossils below and none above. Wow. And that's when we really knew. And uh, you know, there have been there have been hundreds of studies, if not thousands of studies since then, sort of backing this up. You know, we know uh, fairly high confidence can say that that was actually the demise of the dinosaurs. But since that time, I've always wondered, you know, well, this process happens, you know, asteroids do hit the earth, you know, how are we going to stop this in the future? You know, at some point, your number's up. It's just an odds game. Hmm. But that's no longer true when you have telescopes and rockets. Hmm. And so at some level, it's up to us to use those telescopes, rockets, and hopefully some bit of maturity and foresight to make the investments to set it up such that the third planet from the sun never gets hit by a large asteroid again. Mm -hmm. So Frank, I'm curious because your background and the work that SETI does is extremely different. And so what interest does SETI have in asteroids? Aren't you looking for life beyond Earth? And you know, is there life on asteroids? Yeah, we are different, uh, but we are scientists too. So we basically have a goal. Uh, the goal of the SETI Institute is to find life elsewhere and find a technology called civilization. And one of the tools we use for this is the Drake equation. And one of the last parameters of the Drake equation is the L, which is the duration of a technology called civilization. So one of the questions we have is what is the duration of a techni technological civilization? And if we ask this question, you, also, you will ask quickly, how can you destroy a technological civilization? Well, an asteroid impact is one of the way you can destroy this civilization. Uh, we don't need to have a catastrophic events like we had for the dinosaurs. Uh, a, a smaller event, well located, for instance, uh, a 30 meter asteroid or for, I would say 100 meter asteroid uh, impacted above a large metropolitan area will disrupt our civilization, will disrupt our technology called civilization. So that's one of the reasons SETI Institute is interesting in learning about uh, in being part of the planetary defense program, because we learn this way how we the, the, the true duration of the technology called civilization. So I'm curious, Dr. Liu, could you tell me, how would you define planetary defense? And then Frank, I'd love you to tell me what citizen astronomers have to do with all of this and how these worlds of big science and citizen science can come together under planetary defense. So first, Dr. Liu, could you define planetary defense for us? Planetary defense is, simp is simply not letting our planet get hit by a large enough asteroid that ca that's capable of causing real damage. And so, what are we capable of doing to defend ourselves? Well, what we're able to do is we're able to find and track asteroids, calculate their orbits accurately enough so that we can know decades in advance if one of these is going to hit the Earth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, we've only done this for a small fraction of asteroids thus far, but that situation is changing. And so the real thing you have to do is, is know in advance that an asteroid is going to hit the Earth, decades in advance. Mm -hmm. Deflecting it is easy small relatively cheap mission all you have to do is run into it with a small spacecraft and in most cases that's enough to cause a tiny little change in the asteroid's trajectory on purpose so that years in the future the earth which remember is a moving target 
um, and th that asteroid no longer on our collision trajectory. That's easy. We're doing that. There's a mission called DART that will launch next October that is uh, going to do that on a, on a test asteroid. So remember, planetary defense for all effect, you know, for all you know, effective purposes today means finding, cataloging, tracking, and predicting the locations of asteroids into the future. That's the name of the game. So Frank, what role do citizen astronomers play? Because I can definitely understand the role of, you know, huge forces and and rockets but everyday people with the ev scope in their backyards what does that have to do with planetary defense so i would like to remind uh, the uh, in fact that the congress asked uh, in 2005 uh, to discover 90 percent of all near-earth asteroids with a diameter larger than 140 meters by 2020 and guess what <laughs> this is 2020. I just realized that this morning, in fact, this is the end of the challenge. We're not going to make that deadline. <laughs> we are not going to make this deadline, despite everything. We uh, Last time I look, we know a third of those uh, 25,000 asteroids larger than 140 meters. Hmm. Only a third. So why did we, why we did not manage to do this? Well, it's because we don't have telescopes looking at the sky continuously. We have more and more of them, that's true, and we are building fantastic telescopes to do these surveys, such as uh, LSST that will come in 2020, 2021-22, and also the recent ATLAS, which are an amazing telescopes to be able to track those targets. But they, they came on in a game very late. In two, in, ATLAS started three years ago only. Mm -hmm. So what we realize now is that we need to have an array of telescopes capable of observing the sky 24 seven, because most of the time we see a tele uh, we see an, an asteroid potentially uh, a potentially hazardous asteroid, but we lose it very quickly because mm -hmm. we don't have the capability to follow up its orbit. So what we can what we're proposing to do with the Unistellar network is to to um, involve our citizen astronomers in this search in this hunt for potentially hazardous asteroids. So concretely, I don't know if you want me to enter in the details, but concretely what they will do is to receive notification on their phone when something is, has been detected by one of those large facilities I mentioned before and asking our citizen astronomers if they want to spend some time to follow up this asteroid so we can refine the orbit and we will not lose it. And that's one of the key parts here. We don't want to lose it because sometimes we see one, but then we don't have additional observations. Mm -hmm. With this array of telescope, we'll be able to follow it for a sufficient amount of time to be able to calculate precisely the orbit. And know, as, as Ed mentioned, if it will impact Earth at its next flyby, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, it seems that there is a lot more conversation lately about asteroids. And Dr. Liu, you mentioned the DART mission. And Frank has said, I think 2021 is going to be the year of the asteroids. You know, Mars, the moon, they've had their time to shine. Do you agree? What missions are coming up ahead and what might we learn? Well, we just had an interesting thing happen um, about three days ago, which was the return of the samples from the Hayabusa 2 mission uh, from an asteroid. And that uh, that capsule carrying the samples just uh, landed in, in Australia just the other day. So that was a, uh, so didn't, that's 2020 actually, actually made it in 2020. Yeah. Uh, the other thing we have coming back is samples from uh, a mission called OSIRIS-REx, much much larger amount of samples, but that's on its way back. It's going to be a few years before it makes it back to Earth, but it's on its way back to Earth. And, and there's also a number of upcoming missions. Uh, these are scientific missions to learn more about the history of, of asteroids, not as much about planetary defense, more about understanding the evolution of the solar system and the planetary bodies, which is still extraordinarily interesting. So, you know, I would say that, you know, both asteroid science and planetary defense are, uh, they're gonna be very important over the next few years. Uh, the, the other remaining things that are, are really, really going to change things are this telescope, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, recently renamed the Vera Rubin Observatory after uh, an astronomer, Vera Rubin. Um, 
it will be the world's largest survey telescope for finding asteroids. And it's been under construction for a number of years and it is opening uh, just in a couple of years on a mountaintop in Chile. It's funded by the National Science Foundation primarily. And uh, that is going to really, really change the discovery rate of asteroids. There are additional NASA missions which are proposed and we hope to hope they will fly that will put telescopes in space to find and track asteroids. And so a lot of things are going to be happening here. You're going to be reading a lot about discoveries, uh, both of individual asteroids as well as large numbers of them for the purposes of planetary defense. So speaking of interesting discoveries, Frank and the SETI and Unistellar teams have been working on something and it's only the 69th time in history that this has been done. It's specific to an asteroid. Can you tell us a little bit more about this recent round of research that was conducted between SETI and uh, the Unistellar Citizen Astronomer Network? Yeah, so we, uh, we found out that an asteroid called 1999 AP10, very nice name, we'll go back to that. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, we're going to work on this whole naming thing. We, uh, we, we, we're going to talk about that. It <laughs> was about to uh, fly by Earth. That was in September. I was in, uh, in, in Europe at the time. We're talking with my colleagues. And this, uh, this is a in very interesting asteroid because it's uh, an EA, a near Earth asteroid uh, from the Amor population. So it will not impact our planet. But it's large enough and will be, clo will be coming close enough to us that the Unistellar network will be able to take a, a lot of data. And we didn't know much about it. We knew only its trajectory, its orbit, and the rough idea of its, its shape and size, and that's all. So we collected data, and uh, we uh, sent requests of obs for observation to our network, and hoping that people will observe it. And in fact, we got uh, 81 light curves. So what is a light curve? So an asteroid is not spherical. It's always kind of like that typically, okay? And asteroids spin. So when you observe an asteroid with a telescope, you don't see the shape of the asteroid. You see only the light that is reflected by the asteroid. But if the asteroid spin and also move with respect to Earth, you will basically see a small variation of brightness over time. So we collected all our observation and we saw this variation of brightness and this variation of brightness changed because of the change of geometry between us, uh, Earth and the asteroid. And we use a technique that we call light curve inversion that's been developed by my colleagues, uh, Mikko Kazanlainen and uh, others in, uh, in Europe. And with these techniques, we've been able to reconstruct the shape of the asteroid. So that's been, now we know the spin very accurately to the order of a tenth of a second. And we know the pole, I mean, the orientation at which the, the, the asteroid is moving. And we know now the shape of the asteroid. So I don't have a shape with me yet, but I will receive one soon. But it's basically, it's not, it's not a very homogeneous shape. It's been, um, it, it's flattened along the spin axis, uh, along the, 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 the pole. It's slightly elongated at the equator and it's not symmetrical. It's a 1.6 kilometer asteroid. So we are not expecting to see something uh, homogeneous, except if it was a rubble pie, if it had been a rubble pie asteroid. So now what I can say is that it's not a rubble pie asteroid, probably. It's what we call a coherent asteroid made of rock. Um, for the one, one who wants to know everything, it's an S-type asteroid, probably. So it's uh, made of mafic materials, kind of eros. And this is an interesting because that's the first time our network has been able to contribute significantly to, to detection and characterization of an NEAs. We created this network thinking that will be possible. And just a year after we start basically the campaign of observation, we get our first results. Yeah, so this is an amazing thing, actually, because there is, it's a different way of, of, of tackling these problems rather than large professional observatories. It's many small um, privately owned observatories networked up. And I think that's an amazing achievement. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Coming from you, that's... <laughs> well, we, we have I, had have, yeah, I have one of these. I'm a proud owner of one of these things too. So. <laughs> well, next time we're going to get some of the observation from you too then. <laughs> I, I need to get on board with that, yes. Yeah. 
So I'm going to come back to this in a moment. As Frank mentioned, this is the shape of the asteroid. And we do have a contest coming where you have the chance to nickname it. But I'm curious what the process is typically like. Dr. Liu, could you tell us, because I've seen that you have been involved in this process of discovering and naming an asteroid. So once one is discovered, how does it become legitimized? How do we enter it into this base of knowledge that exists? <laughs> There's a whole process involved here. Um, astronomers have sort of self-appointed themselves uh, the ability to name things. Um, it's, I don't know, really know how it evolves, but they have, uh, you know, set a set of guidelines which they sort of voluntarily follow. But, um, and it's, it, it's put through a body called the Inter International Astronomical Union, which is, it's just a group, you know, it's astronomers. And um, so typically the rule is that if you discover it, you get to name it. <laughs> you can okay. submit a name at least. And they have some um, rules and regulations and a whole bunch of stuff on that. But um, there is no law that says this is the name. There is no ownership of these things. So it's just kind of a convention, truthfully. Okay. <laughs> Well, I know yeah. that's the end of our time with Dr. Lou. Frank is going to stick around with me and we'll tell you a little bit about that contest and more. Um, so as you're departing, I just want to thank Dr. Ed Lou for your time today. You have been a wonderful esteemed guest and thank you for your work in the subject of planetary defense. So yeah. we appreciate thank you very much. And like I said, I'm a proud member of the community of uh, EV scope uh, operators, owners, operators. Um, and I, I, I think, Frank, that, that what's been done here is a fabulous demonstration of a new way of uh, doing astronomy using these widely dispersed uh, telescopes that are that were that are, were sort of voluntarily uh, put together network. Uh, and I think that's an amazing thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. And Frank, I want you to stick around and tell us a little bit more because you are actually, you have an asteroid that bears your name. Can you tell us about how that came about? How did you discover this asteroid? So I did not discover this asteroid. 6639, I forgot its uh, official name, uh, was one of these unnamed asteroids. And uh, in 2005, um, uh, we, we discover uh, moon, moons around asteroids. Okay. And an amateur astronomer with who I was working on this project wrote a proposal to the International Astronomical Union asking them to name this asteroid uh, uh, Marchis. And he surprised me. He gave it to me as a birthday present, in fact. That's the way I found out. That is amazing. Yeah. Okay, so tell us about, there is a contest that we're running right now and what a birthday present this would be to have your loved one's name on an asteroid. Can you tell us just a little bit about the contest? Yeah, so the, the idea is to, is to basically name 1999 AP10 because as you may have noticed, it's already difficult for us to say it. So we'll have to have a name which kind of um, better represent this asteroid. Um, we know 24,000 asteroids at the moment. Very few, uh, any is asteroids, sorry. Very few of them have names. So that's an opportunity. Uh, it, this asteroid was discovered by Linear, which is a project. So it's not a one person, it's a project that discovered this asteroid in, in 1999. So what we're proposing to do is to collect from this community, from this hive of brains that we have on this planet, very creative people, you and you and you, you know who I'm talking about, to kind of give us some ideas of names. And we will collect the best one. I mean, you can maybe, Whitney, help me with the, the process. And then there will be some kind of decision taken to nickname this asteroid. That is right. Join us. You can enter your name or vote at our website, or you can just simply come to our Unistellar Facebook page. There are some top vote getters that are really hilarious and charming. So I hope that everybody will take a moment to have their chance at getting an asteroid named after them. 
So with that, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Frank. It's been great to see you again this week. And to everybody out there in the universe, I wish you clear skies and wide eyes throughout December. So long. Bye-bye.